ಓಗೀಶಮಸಗಾನಸರ್ವರ್ಥನಾಪಕ್ರಮೆ ಯಂ ನತ್ವಾ ಕೃತಕೃತ್ಯ ಸ್ಯೂತ ನಮಿ ಗಜಾನನ ಮೂಕ ಕರೋತಿ ವಾಚಾಲ ಪಂಗು ಲಂಕೆಯತೆ ಗಿರಿ ಯತ್ಕೃಪಾತಮಹಂ ವಂದೇ ಪರಮಾನಂದಮಾಧವ ಯಂ ಪ್ರಬ್ರಜಂತಮನುಪೇತಮೇತಕೃತ್ಯೋ ವಿರಹ ಕಾತರ ಆಜುಹಾವ ಪುತ್ರೇತಿ ತನ್ಮಯತೆಯ ತರವೋಭಿನೇತು ಸಂಸರ್ವೂತಹೃದ ಮುನಿಮಾನಸೋಸ್ಮಿ ಸದಾ ಶಿವ ಸಂಭಾಂ ಶಂಕರಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಮಧ್ಯ ಅಸ್ಮದಾಚಾರ್ಯಪರ್ಯಂತ ವಂದೇ ಗುರುಪರಂಪರಾ ಯೋಗಿನ ವಿಶ್ವನಾಥಾಖ್ಯಸ್ಮತ್ತಾತಸ್ವೂಪಿಣ ಆತ್ಮಲಾಭಾತ್ಪರಂ ಲಾಭಂ ವಕ್ತ ಆರಂ ನ ಕದಾಚನ ಗೀತಾರ್ಥಗ್ರಂಥಕರ್ತಾರಂ ಶ್ರೀಗುರು ಪ್ರಣಮ್ಯಹಂ ಯೋಂತ ಪ್ರವಿಶ್ಯ ಮೇ ವಾಚಂ ಧೃತಿ ಬುದ್ಧಿ ಪ್ರಚೋದಯತ್ ಓಂ ನಮ ಸಭಾಭ್ಯ ಸಭಾಪತಿಭ್ಯಶ್ಚ ಓ ನಮಃ ಫ್ರೆಂಡ್ಸ್ ಟುಡೇ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಗೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಟಾ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ಎ ನ್ಯೂ ಸೀರೀಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಲೆಕ್ಚರ್ಸ್ ಕಾಲ್ಡ್ ಧ್ರುವ ಸ್ತುತಿ ದಿಸ್ ಈಸ್ ಎ ಸ್ಮಾಲ್ ಪೋರ್ಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ಟ್ವೆಲ್ ಶ್ಲೋಕಸ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದಿ ಶ್ರೀಮದ್ ಭಾಗವತಂ ಶ್ರೀಮದ್ ಭಾಗವತಂ ಕನ್ಸಿಸ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಏಯ್ಟೀನ್ ಥೌಸಂಡ್ ಶ್ಲೋಕಸ್ ವಿಚ್ ಆರ್ ಡಿವೈಡೆಡ್ ಇನ್ ಟು ಟ್ವೆಲ್ ಸ್ಕಂದಸ್ ಆರ್ ಸೆಕ್ಷನ್ಸ್ ಈಚ್ ಸ್ಕಂದ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಸೆವರಲ್ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ಸ್ ಸೊ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಗೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಸೀ ದಿ ಫೋರ್ತ್ ಸ್ಕಂದ ನೈನ್ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ಟ್ವೆಲ್ ಶ್ಲೋಕಸ್ ಇನ್ ಇಟ್ ದಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಆಲ್ ವಾಟ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಗೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಸೀ ದಿಸ್ ಈಸ್ ಎ ಪ್ರೇಯರ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಸೆಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಶ್ಲೋಕಸ್ ರಿಸೈಟೆಡ್ by dhruva a 5 year old boy i have to give you a little background of the story of dhruva here we are going back to 2 billion years ago there might be a controversy on this calculation of my timing of the time calculation but we will leave that for a different session right now 2 billion years ago brahma's creation started swayambhuva manu and shatarupa were created by him as the first couple and this dhruva little boy was a grandson of swayambhuva manu this dhruva's father had two wives suniti suruchi but the father that is the dhruva's father did not like the first wife dhruva was the first wife's son so they were underrated so to say dhruva and his mother one particular day this dhruva as a 5 year old boy went to his father and saw his his step brother uttama that is the second wife's son was sitting on the lap of the father so he wanted also to get on to the lap of his father but the second wife who was sitting next to the king uh, would not agree and she said that you fellow you should have to be born to me in order to be able to sit on the lap of the uh, king so for that you go to the you go to the temple god forest whatever whatever and pray to god and the boy came back crying came back to his mother the mother was he- equally helpless so the helpless mother could not um, do anything further she also re- said the same thing there is no other um, resort for us except god lord narayana you go to a solitary place and keep meditating on him and pray that you uh, things are better for you so the boy was uh, immediately i mean he caught the spirit of the thing and immediately headed towards the forest narada the roaming uh, rishi all over the world so he came along and tried to dissuade him don't a uh, little boy you don't know how difficult it is to go in a forest and uh, meditate on the lord we elderly people great rishis we find it very difficult to see him you can never uh, it's not possible to see him the boy would not agree the boy said uh, 
Marshe, you tell me how to see the Lord. Don't tell me anything else. Tell me how I should recognize him, what I should tell him, how he would look like. You describe him to me. And Narada now decided that this, uh, I mean, admired the persistence of Dhruva, little Dhruva, and explained to him how God will look like. Shankachakra Gadadhari, he described a beautiful, there are beautiful shlokas in the Bhagavatam, and he described the Lord with the four arms and what he has in his four different arms, and also he gave this little boy a mantra, a twelve-letter mantra, Dvadashakshara mantra, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevayam, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. This mantra was taught to him and Narada said, you go to a solitary place and start uh, meditating on this. And the boy left. Narada went back to the king and also uh, made arrangements in such a way that the king does not go after the boy searching for him and disturb him. So he said, don't disturb him. He is going to be a great person in future. And... Um, so he uh, prevented that kind of disturbance and therefore everything was set right for Dhruva. Dhruva did tapas in the forest for five and a half months. You cannot believe it. We do not know how it happened. In the first month <coughs> he was um, eating only fruits that were available right there in that uh, forest. Only fruits. Second month, and, and that too, only yeah, once in three days, once in three days. In the second month, once in six days, he was eating only grass dry and dried leaves. In the third month, once in nine days, he was only drinking water. And he was reciting this, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, all the time, all waking up time, whatever. And in the fourth month, he was, I am told, in the Bhagavatam that he was only taking air in and nothing else. He was living on air. Don't ask me how he lived. I mean, I, I have no experience. None of us have that experience. But that is what he did. And in the fifth month, he even held back the breath that it shook the entire three worlds. And the divines, they were in great stress. They went to the Lord, uh, Lord Vishnu and said, please go and give a darshan to him immediately. And uh, the Lord said, yes, I will do that. And so the Lord appeared before Dhruva. But the boy was seeing, visualizing in his own inner eye that form which Narada had described to him so well, Shantachakra Gadadhari. So he was seeing that in his own heart of hearts, so he would not open his eyes. The real Lord was sitting, standing before him, but he would not open his eyes. So the Lord uh, had to do a trick. He erased that picture from his inner eye and immediately he opened his eyes and saw the very Lord that he was seeing inside, that very Lord he was able to see outside. And he did not know what to do. He immediately fell at a God's feet and stood up, but now he wanted to talk. He had no, he had, he had not yet had his alphabet training. He would not. He has no education. What will he say? So he would not. He was not able to say anything. And the Lord realized it. So he touched him on both the cheeks by his conch, Shankha. Shankha stands for the Vedas. So by touching him, the moment he touched the boy, the the, all the inspiration, all the teaching, all the intuitive understanding of the entire Vedanta came to the boy. And he is going to decide these twelve shlokas. That is where we are. We are going to see these twelve shlokas. And uh, you, you would want to have, the, my viewers would have, want to have this text before them. So I am showing you a URL where I have got that text of the twelve shlokas and also a little gist of the commentary that I am going to make. I will recite the shlokas each time and give you the meaning and comment on these shlokas. The boy started just like that.
This is the first sloka of the 12 slokas. This occurs in the 9th chapter, 9th chapter of the 4th skanda of Srimad Bhagavatam. Those expositors of Bhagavatam whom we have seen everywhere, when they expound this Bhagavatam for 9 days or 15 days or whatever, they don't find time to elaborate the, on these 12 shlokas because they have a lot of stories to tell and they have a lot of portions to cover. So they sometimes spend a little time on this first shloka and then go forward. But we are going to see all these 12 shlokas, uh, shloka by shloka and it contains the entire Vedanta. How does it? Because he, he has been touched by the Shankha of the Lord, so now Dhruva has become a Dhruva Swami. In fact, the Tamil world speaks of him as Dhruva Swami girl. You see, after all, he was a little boy, and the entire Vedanta is here. We are going to elaborate on that. Yunta Pravishya Bhavavachami Bam Prasuptam Yaha Anta Pravishya. Antaf Pravishya, he who has entered me, Yaha, uh, he who, Antaf Pravishya, entered me and has activated, enlivened, my Mama Vacham Imam Prasuptam, Sanjeevayati, Mama Vacham, my speech, Imam Prasuptam, this speech which has been sleeping all these days, that has been activated, enlivened by me. Remember the Lord has activated his speech and actually we should consider it as the Lord himself is speaking about himself. So that is why this Sotra, the Bhagavatam contains a lot of Sotra, Suchis like this. But this one is superb because of the fact that it is the Lord himself through Dhruva speaking on himself. So, Mama Vacham Imam Prasuptam Sanjeevayati. Thus, um, it has enlivened. Akila Shakti Dharas Sodhamna. How does it uh, activate me? Because by his own glory, Sodhamna, Akila Shakti Dharaha, he is able to give the energy, the Shakti, the power to the entire world. Not only that, he has en enlivened, activated my speech. Not only that, but Anyamsha, Hasta, Charana, Shravana, Togadin. My hands, my feet, my ears, my skin, all these things have been activated by Him. Prana, my prana, my life itself has been activated by Him. Namo Bhagavate Purushaya Tubhyam. For that great person, Purushaya Tubhyam Namaha, I prostrate before you. This is the simple meaning of that sotra. But there is a lot to say here. Antaf Pravishya, Antaf Pravishya, he has entered me. Entered me is a very weak translation of what that shloka says. Because the Taitriya Upanishad says, Tat Srishtva, Tat Deva, Nupravishati, Anupravishati, it says, Anu, anu, anu pravesha, it is called an immanent entry. Anu pravesha, just, not just an entry of something outside into something other than that. No, there is only one thing everywhere. The, uh, this self and the ultimate God, Supreme, they are both the same. So there is no question of entering. That Srishtva, after having created it, he entered it. Brahmadaranya Upanishad elaborately gives, uh, Shankaracharya gives a commentary on this and Taitri Upanishad also there is a commentary with Shankaracharya at this place, Tat Srishtva, Tat Eva, Nupra, Vishat, for that the sum and substance of that uh, commentary is that this Anupravesha is not a, is not a uh, entry of something into something other than that. It is upalabdhi. What is upalabdhi? Availability. What does the Lord do? The Lord is, we say immanent. Immanent is an English word. It says, 
whatever does it say it says the lord the the uh, god is available right there right here right everywhere he is immanent everywhere in fact the major points of hinduism uh, the major two points are transcendence and immanence the properties of god one is he is beyond everything another is he is inside everything he is anup he has got he has entered everything so there is an antarvyapti antarvyapti is immanence bahir vyapti is transcendence that is why your vishnu sahasranam happens begins with vishwam vishnu vashatkaro vishwam is immanence vishnu is vyapti bahir vyapti transcendence vyapte vishnu vishwa means vishi entry vishi vishi to enter you will see wherever this idea of immanence comes vishi will appear the root word vishi will appear this is the antaryamitvam of the lord and this is the most important uh, unique feature of hinduism i do not know as far as i know there is no other religion which talks of immanence every religion talks of the transcendence of god god is beyond us this that everything but um, i think only hinduism talks about immanence of the lord and that is why man is essentially divine essentially divine this is a unique feature of hindu thinking essentially divine why do we say essentially divine because he is immanent in us our self is nothing but god though he is immanent in the in secular life also you see this gives you the reason why you have to respect the dignity of man dignity of everybody because everybody in everybody the, the same god he is immanent not in different proportions it is not as if he is immanent very well in a good man and he is immanent weakly in a bad man no he is immanent the same way in everybody's uh, heart of hearts and therefore in the secular life you respect you this is the reason why you have to respect the dignity of man <clears throat> okay so yom tap pravishya mam vacham imam prasuptam Sanya, I am taking the important words from the shloka, and as I told you, you will need to keep the shloka before you when you listen to me. Sanjiva yati, Sanjiva yati is the next word. Jiva bhutam mahabaho yadam dhatyate jagate. This is from the Gita. Jiva bhutam. How does he? How does he activate? He activates because there are. to he what he the, the lord is nirvikari he is you no know, he doesn't act it is prakriti that acts prakriti is at the motivation of the lord the lord motivates prakriti to act there are two prakritis para prakriti and apara prakriti as uh, described in the 7th chapter of the gita the para prakriti is what has come as jiva bhutam mahabaho yenam dhadyate jagate has come as the consciousness in us the apara prakriti is all matter is all material universe so that is why the moment that pra- para prakriti has taken itself as an immanent being in our system the sanjeevayati the activation happens again come on anyam sya hasta charana shravanatva gadin pranam namo bhagavate purushaya tubyam purushaya purusha means person if you see the sanskrit dictionary but that is not the simple meaning that is not the only meaning that is a very simple meaning of the word purusha purusha as a tremendous vedantic meaning in it पूर्वमेवाहमिहासपिति i was there before everything that is why it is he is called Pur- purusha 
he is also there are so many different ways in which that purusha has a meaning <coughs> puri shete iti purushaha puri shete iti purushaha so puri means devanam pura yodhya this body is called ayodhya pu pu means city is it navadware pure dehi says the gita the city of nine gates the body so the body is described as a city pu pura so puri shete iti purusha puri means in this city he is resting he is located puri that is why in the vishnu sahasranam you get the t- sequence of words avyaya purusha sakshi purushaha and sakshi he is sitting as a purushaha he is sitting as a witness consciousness the fact that he is sitting as a witness consciousness in us is what is meaning of immanence immanence does not mean he is this small or that small or he is sitting here or here or there or in the heart there is a hole that is where all those things are only poetic descriptions Isn't it? So this immanence means he is available as a witness consciousness. Upalabdhi. Pranam namo Bhagavate Purusha yato bhim Bhagavate Bhagavan. Bhagavan is an important word. Bhagavan. Bhagav means there are six properties, peculiar properties, unique properties of the Lord. whoever has this is called bhagavan gnana aishwarya shakti bala virya tejas gnana is wisdom knowledge aishwarya is wealth prosperity shakti is power energy bala is strength virya is uh, uh, what shall i say the generating spirit generation tejas is brilliance you see advaita says there is only one god there is only one almighty ultimate supreme reality is only one but our mythology has so many divines and gods there there is a confusion for a westerner or an unknowing indian to think that there is a whole hierarchy of gods there is something greater there is a, someone who is the father someone who is the son someone who is the mother the all this hierarchy is uh, only a uh, maya it is not uh, real the real thing is only one supreme and in order to confuse you or otherwise there is the mythology has got so many ways of bringing these divines in the devi mahatmyam the description of the parashakti her manifestation her manifestation is given in terms of three manifestations maha um, maha uh, lakshmi maha kali maha saraswati maha lakshmi maha kali maha saraswati three different manifestations and then there are stories about them it is from this maha lakshmi gnana and bala comes gnana and bala gnana in the form of um, uh, uh, saraswati and bala in the form of shiva saraswati and shiva this is why in various mythological literature they are considered as brother and sister saraswati and shiva similarly the after mahalakshmi there was mahakali another manifestation from the mahakali aishwarya and virya comes aishwarya is wealth which is lakshmi virya is generating uh, spirit that is brahma so lakshmi and brahma are considered as brother and sister again the third one maha saraswati from the maha saraswati shakti and tejas shakti and tejas comes shakti is durga and tejas is vishnu they are considered as brother and sister all this 
can naturally confuse us. All this only means that no such all uh, ordinary worldly hierarchy will work. You have to think that all of them are manifestations of the same single supreme spirit. That is Bhagavan. So, Prananamo Bhagavate Purushayatubhyam. Uh, now, now I come to the most important word, Namaha. Namaha. He uses the word Namaha for prostration. All of us use the word for Namaha for prostration. Namaha does not simply mean prostration. It means quite a lot because of the way the words, the letters are built there. Na ma Namaha. Na mama. You see? When you when you say Namaha, Keshavaya Namaha, it is not mine, it is yours. Namama. The, the idea of Namama is built in Namaha. The idea of Namama. That is not mine, not mine, not mine. Nothing is mine, nothing is ours, everything is God's. So that is why the word Namaha is built there. The Taitri Upanishad says, Tamma yitupa sita namyante es my kapa. Excuse me. Tamma yitupa sita. Worship him with nama. Then namyante as my kapa. I am now quoting the Taitri Upanishad. It says with authority. The one who worships him by the word nama, Namaha, him the desires worship. Namyante asmai kama. Kama desires. Asmai, the him. Right? Kanamyante. They worship. What else should we want? You see, it is the desires that bother us all the time. It is the desires that control us. It is the desires that draw us in all directions. And it is the desires that disturb us all the time. It is the desire that is the root of all of our further evils and further sorrow. If the desires bow before us and listen to us and obey what we want them to do, oh, that is the most thing, wonderful thing. That is why we worship the Lord as Namaha, Namyante, Namayutthas, Nama, um, when I said this to uh, so, some scholars, they said, no, no, the, the same Upanishad also says, Tammana Yityupa, Tammana Yityupa Sita, Nama Yityupa Sita, Nam, you worship him with Nama, it also says, you worship him with Mana. See, the word namama, the Sanskrit, whether you say namama or mamana, both the same thing. So why don't you worship him with manaha? But somehow our tradition, our tradition, Hindu tradition, has uh, concentrated on the word namaha for worship. And for this also, scholars give you a beautiful reason. Because our ego is so strong that when you say mana, indicating mama na mine not in the case of namaha na not mine you see the psychology of human being is the moment you say mine you may not want to say no so manaha is not the right thing for their psychology so scholars are saying this anyway this word nama is so important there is a whole chapter in the uh, Yajurveda called Rudra chapter. Rudra Namakam. It is Namaha Namaso Mahajata Rudra Jata Namastam Rajata. It goes with Namaha 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 on 300 times, more than 300 times. It goes there and it is supposed to be very powerful for uh, worship. There is another chapter in the Yajurveda in the Aranyaka, that, that is in Samhita, in the Aranyaka, Surya Namaskara Prashna. There is a Prashna, first Prashna, where there is, you use the uh, text for doing Namaskara to the Lord, Sun God. So you do 108 uh, Namaskaras, prostrations to the Sun God. <clears throat> and there, there is a lot of descriptions about these prostrations. Then this Shishira Ritu 
it describes the different seasons. When the Shishira Ritu comes, it describes Tvankaro Shinjalikam, Tvankaro Shinijanukam, Nijanukam e Enyan Jalikam, Aviva Chamupa Satamiti, Tasmai Sarvaratamo Namante, Nijanukam e Enyan Jalika, Nija Nijani Janu Kama. Anjali, Anjalika, Anjali is this um, keeping the hands like this and uh, worshipping. That is the meaning of Anjali. Shishira Ritu is the cold season. In the cold season, uh, people were living in the forest, you know, one of us, we are talking of such rishis. So what they, they I mean, um, uh, lit a fire uh, with uh, wood and other things and then try to warm themselves up by sitting near the fire, with knees bent, with knees bent and touching the ground, with hands folded up, that is they um, uh, put their hands on the fire and then bring it here, so that it warms them up. This is what it describes. Tom karo shanjalikam, you make them do anjali. Tom karo shanijanukam, you make them do, knee, bend their knees as a prostration. Nijanukam e enyanjalika. So, he uses the, there is a preposition, knee. Knee means two things, folding posture, nyanjalika. Knee means also, nyakbhuta, touching the ground. This is how even the Veda, you see, describes the Anjali form and the prostrating form with Namaha idea. Uh, so uh, all these things are so important, the word Namaha, that is why we use the word Namaha all the time when we want to worship the Lord. So <clears throat> finally, this shloka, yom taf pravishya mama vacha mimam prasuptam, this shloka, which is the first shloka of all shlokas, the commentators have said that these twelve shlokas represent the twelve adityas. There are twelve adityas, aditi's sons. That is, that is different names for Surya, but there are actually different Suryas. Mitra, Ravi, Surya, Mitra Ravi, Surya, Bhanu, Kaga, Pusha, Hiranyagarbha, Marichi, Aditya, Savita, Arka, Bhaskara. Like that, there are twelve. Right? So each shloka represents that particular facet of that sun god is there in the commentary. But this will take us too much into the technicalities of Vedanta as well as the Sanskrit. But when I come to the 10th shloka, I am going to spend a whole uh, lecture on the 10th shloka because the 10th is, as I told you, the counting Mitra, Ravi, Surya, Bhanu, Kaga, Pusha, Hiranyagarbha, Marichi, Aditya, Savita. Savita is the 10th shloka. Remember, Savita is the, the divine um, that we worship through Gayatri. So that tenth sloka is going to be a representative of Gayatri. We will see that elaborately when we come to that tenth sloka. I will go through sloka by sloka on, on and I would like you to be uh, I would like you to have the text available with you through the URL. With that we will close today and we will continue in the next lecture. Loka Samasta Sukino Bhavantu